Well, I did mention a while ago, uh, I I'm always feel like I'm pressing for time. I've got four pages of notes. I can do that in maybe 35 minutes, which is about what we got now uh, before we uh, close out. And I don't want to uh, abuse my time of going over every week. I know you can do that every once in a while, but I don't want to do that too much. But I'm just pressing for time. I'm pressing to get my stuff done, even when I'm studying, like, oh, I don't have enough stuff, or I have too much material. I need to cut some out, those kinds of things. I really want you to pray for me about that. But I didn't get to finish last week because I didn't get to the last part that I wanted to talk about. So I just decided I'm going to redo it and just focus on those parts, spend some time and revisit what Jesus said, particularly in verse 4 in this text, uh, to the church at Ephesus. He says to this church at Ephesus, he he commends them on several things. It's really, in many ways, a good church. It's it's really a church that you wouldn't mind going to. You have a, a, a list of categories of things you're looking for in a good church. Ephesus works fine. They are a uh, they do good works, righteous deeds. They're dedicated to persevering in the faith. Their faith. They're desiga- de- dedicated to not growing weary and not getting tired of the ministry. Jesus commends them for uh, their solid doctrinal stand. They maintain this uh, discernment uh, to test and get rid of the false teachers. They have a great doctrine, great doctrine. Kick the heretics out. And then Jesus also commends the church for being a morally pure church. It's really a, it's a good church. It's a pure church. There's a group out there of, of called the Nicolaitans, uh, who I guess were in Ephesus too. And it was basically a pseudo-Christian cult or a sect within the cult who were sexually promiscuous and indulgent. Their philosophy was just whatever you want to do. Let, everything's permissible. That's the way they were. And the Ephesian church hated that stuff. So this is really a good church, except this one thing. Verse 4, Jesus said, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And that's where I wanted to camp on a little bit. I didn't really get to work on that last time but many good churches a difficult have this difficulty they're doctrinally sound they have um, they're moral uh, and sometimes churches that are you know, like have good doctrine and good works and good morality sometimes do those things simply as a set of legalistic rules now there's nothing wrong with rules it's just you get where it's legalism our doctrine is our standard our our legalistic code is the way we live our lives, and it's, that's how we live it. And, but having good works and having great doctrine are not satisfactory substitutes for having love. You have to love each other. You have to mutually love each other. You have to love each other in the church. You have to love the other saints who are sitting around you in the church. You have to love them. And it's not as... Having good doctrine, having good morals, having good works are not substitutes for loving God. So the church in Ephesus had forsaken their first love. They had forsaken their love for the brothers. They have uh, run away from, abandoned their love for God. And we looked at this last time. There really is no distinction. You can't say, well, they love God. This is talking about love for God. Well, if you love God, you're going to love his brother, his children. You're going to love his people. It's the same thing. You can't have one without the other. You love God, you love his people. They're, that's how, what he means by obeying him. But the church in Ephesus had forsaken their brothers. They ceased to love them. They have stopped loving them. They left loving them. They used to love one another, but then something came into their lives, something came into the church and diminished that and made that less till virtually, I guess, was it any love at all? I don't know. Their affections for each other had cooled down. And that's just not good for any church. Whatever's good about that church, if their love for each other has cooled down, their affection for each other has diminished, it's not good. In fact, this is how you even know that you are a Christian. Jesus said in John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. This is his command, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. 
Now, here's how you know if you're even a Christian. This is how you know if you even belong to Jesus. This is how you know if you know if you're a disciple of Christ, if you love the brothers. And I always like to say, when he gave this command to the 12 disciples, you could see these dudes probably looking around going, well, uh, these guys aren't easy to love. It would not be, you wouldn't need a command if, it were easy to, if you were easy to love. You don't have to tell me to love you if you're easy to love. If you're not easy to love, you have to command me to love you. And you have to command, he has to command you to love me because I'm not easy to love. That's what he means. But you love each other, and that's how they're going to know you're my disciples if you love one another. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 14.1, follow the way of love. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16.14, do everything in love. Jesus said in Matthew, you know, the lawyer came up to him, teacher, what was the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, 37 to 40, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, in other words, the entire Old Testament revelation of God sums up in these two commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, Love your neighbors yourself. The whole law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Paul writes to the Colossians chapter 3, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, awesome stuff. This is how we ought to live our lives, right? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience with each other. Bear with each other. Forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's, that's, that's the way a, a church ought to be. But then he says this in verse 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So love is really the ultimate thing here. This is a great church, but Jesus has this against them. They left their first love. They have forsaken their love. And love is not just your affections. I, don't, I want to be careful how I define it because I do believe love includes affections. You have affections for people. You like them. You want to be around them. You enjoy their fellowship. You enjoy their relationship. You enjoy their company. You have affection for them. You, you tenderly, <clears throat> you, you like them tenderly. It's sweet. That's part of love. But love is more than just affections. It's a sacrificial, determined giving of yourself to put the good of someone else ahead of your good. That's love. That's what God, that's how God loved us. He loved us by sending his son into the world to die for us. When we were his enemies, when we were sinners, he gave his son to die for us. That's love. But love, according to the church in Ephesus there in Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7, if, if Jesus likes everything about them, I commend you for your works, I commend you for your doctrine, I commend you for your perseverance, I commend you for your morality, but I don't like this about you. You get this, you get this picture like, like the most important thing is love. That's what they're not doing. It's more important than all the things, all the other things, more important than your doctrine, more important than your behavior, your morality, your ministry, more important than your service, more important than your gifts, more important than your talent or your devotion. It's more important than every other thing in the Christian life. If you don't have love, then it's really, not really easy to discern if you're even a Christian at all, if you don't love the brothers. But that's how Jesus said, all men will know you're my disciples, right? So love is supreme. Love is the ultimate. Love is the number one quality in a Christian's life. Love is the number one quality in, a, in the life of a church. The corporate church together, God's Christ's body in each location where it's at. More important than all the other godly virtues there are. And the New Testament emphasizes love more than any other thing. And if we don't have love individually as a Christ, person, individual Christian, or if we don't have love together corporately as a church, then we're not really able to have a meaningful Christian life or a meaningful Christian church. That's, that's, 
That's the truth. And I'm, everything I'm about to say tonight, I'm, I'm really preaching about myself because I've been convicted about this. Jesus had this against the church in Ephesus. Jesus is rebuking them. Jesus is reprimanding them. Jesus is expressing his displeasure with this church. They have abandoned their love for each other. And by doing that, they've really abandoned their love for Christ and all the other, all the other virtues they have are sort of secondary. If Jesus were to ask them, do you love me? Their answer would have to be, well, in all honesty, if we really got down to our heart, heart of hearts and soul searching, we would get to the place where we go, no, I really don't love you. You know how you know you don't love him? Because you don't love his people. This is what's going on with them. No, loving Christ does mean obeying his commands. It definitely means that. And loving Christ definitely means loving his people. It definitely means that. But I want to go with just one quick step beyond that. We're supposed to be a people who just loves him. I mean, we, we love Jesus Christ. We love Jesus. We love him more than anything else. Now, that is, that is going to express itself in obeying his commands. That is going to express itself in, obeying, in, in loving the other brothers. It's going to mean that, too. But it's just loving him. He said in uh, Matthew 10, 37, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, nothing else matters more. Nothing else is important as your love for Jesus Christ. Just loving him. Who do you love more, your parents, your kids, or Jesus, or anything? You know, in John 21, uh, after Jesus' resurrection, and they're uh, out there at the Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, and Jesus asked Peter three times, uh, Luke, John 21, 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Like, I want to know if you love me. I don't want to know what your doctrine is about me. I don't know what your, what, want to know what your works are about me. I don't want to know what your morals are concerning me. I want to know if you love me. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then he said, okay, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Be responsible to minister to my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Bless my sheep. Then love everybody else. But I need you to love me first, Jesus says. Luke, thir Luke 16, 13, he says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you can't love Jesus and all this other stuff. You love Jesus. Because if you love Jesus and this other stuff, you're going to love one and not the other one. And it usually turns out that you love the other things and not Jesus. That's what he means. You can't serve two masters. Either Jesus is the one you love or you love something else. And this is really bad for a church. When you read this text, you read this section of scripture, you read this about this church in Ephesus to the church in Ephesus, and you read it, and every, every church that reads it, every Christian that reads it, I mean, I'm reading it, and I'm like, it alarms my soul. It really does alarm me. And it should alarm everyone that Jesus would, be, would not be pleased with you because you don't love him and you don't love his people. That you would have to apply this, that Jesus is going to apply his displeasure to you. It's very critical that none of us forsake our love for Christ. We have to be careful to nurture our devotion to him, uh, not by merely having all the other good things the Ephesians had. Yeah, we have the best doctrine in Myrtle Beach. Our church has the best doctrine of any other church. We got that. We have a lot of good works too. We have a lot of a lot of people doing things around here and serving. We're good works. I think for the most part we're immoral people, aren't we? We're, aren't we? Aren't we good, moral? 
but are we loving Jesus? Now, there are days when it seems weak and uncertain. I'm talking about me. I know it's, you're going to be thinking I'm talking about you, but I'm talking about me. There are days when my love for Jesus is very weak and uncertain. I'm just struggling. But when you get down to your heart of hearts, you know you love him more than anything. Or at least that's what you want it to be. And because I love him more than anything, consequently, I love each other. We love each other like we love ourselves. We love your, your neighbor like you love yourself. But here's this church in Ephesus who's really a good church, really is a good church, but Jesus is not happy with it. That bugs me. He holds it against them that they've abandoned their first love. He holds it against them that they have abandoned their love for him. He holds it against them that they've abandoned their love for each other. Now, this is what's cool about this. Because he's gracious, he always gives us opportunity to change. It says, uh, verse 5, remember the height from which you have fallen. And I did talk a little bit about this last time. Uh, uh, this is why I got sidetracked. I'm really thinking about this. Remember, which means you, you got to remember, you can't forget. If you forget where you were, when you were a young Christian, when you were a new Christian, does anybody remember that? Like it's different now. I'm talking about me. I know it's way different now. But there was a day when I remember, I remember this. Um, early on in my Christian life, I would wake up in the morning, first thing, first thing, open my eyes, roll over off the bed on my knees and just start praising God, thanking him. Love Jesus. And I love my brothers. I didn't care what was wrong with them. I didn't care one bit what was wrong with anybody. If they had a fish sign on their car, I was in love with them. If they had a cross around their neck, oh, you're a Christian, I'll pray. Oh, oh, oh. Hug fest, love fest, the whole, the whole passion was there, every bit of it. And then after a while, you know, went to, went to a Bible college and you got some Christians there who were just weird. You know, Ugh. remember this one lady that worked with Lisa. Lisa was saying something and the lady goes, don't speak that. She thought if you spoke it, it's going to come true. The health and wealth, the speak, prosperity gospel, speaking you what they call a positive confession. It's like, who are these people? Who are these Christians coming from that are just weird? They have bad theology and bad doctrine. I don't like them anymore. I don't like the guy that stand up in chapel and goes, Father, and he start praying goofy prayers out loud. Like, wasn't he? Didn't he make any sense to me? I'm like, I, I'll, after a while, you start going, I just don't even want to be around people like that. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about really. I'm talking about me. But go back to the days when you really did love God and you loved other people and it was at the height. Remember the height from which you've fallen. You were peaking in how much you loved God and you were peaking in how much you loved each other. It was warm and it was affectionate. Does anybody remember how things were when you were a new Christian? You were a young Christian. It was fire. You were on fire. Remember how you loved to pray, just worship? Remember how your heart yearned for the joy and the wonder of the grace that you enjoyed just walking with Jesus? You didn't even think about it. You just rolled over off the bed and started praying. First thing. I bet you I hadn't done that in 15 years. So you read Ephesians and you go in, or you read Revelation chapter 2, church in Ephesus, I have this against you. You left your first love. You've forsaken your first love. I mean, he's talking about me. And, he's, and I'm the pastor of this church, so he's talking about us. Hopefully none of y'all are like me. If you, you remember how you just love the brothers? Remember how you used to love to go to church just to be with them? Like I couldn't wait to go to church. I couldn't wait. When I got saved, I went to church. We had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, and Thursday night Bible study. I was at all of them. Loved every bit of it. I love. I used to love it. And it didn't matter who it was. It really didn't. I had Christian radio all the time. One hundred six point nine, Black Mountain, North Carolina. 
Christian teaching all the time. I didn't care who it was. I didn't care if it was my, lined up with every doctrinal position I had. I just loved it. These were, these were great teachers. You used to love to read your Bible. You used to love just to want to know the Lord better. You just read your Bible just to know the Lord better. You read your Bible not to make a sermon, not to make a lesson, not to teach. You just read your Bible because you just wanted to know God. You loved him. You loved him. Remember that height where you were? How far you've fallen away? How far you've backslidden? How far you've lost it? I read my Bible because it's not just so I could learn doctrine. I read my Bible so I could know God. Remember, I remember the times you just had warm, just a warm devotion. You had that morning devotion. Read your Bible for 10, 15, 20 minutes, or however long it was. You don't even know how long it was. You just know you loved every minute of it. Prayed. Remember when you first discovered the treasure? Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. I mean, it's, okay. it's not a burden for this man to go sell everything he has. It doesn't stress him out one second that he's going to lose every single thing he has just to go buy a field. Because you know what he found? He found a treasure in that field. And his joy, I mean, he loved that field. He loved what was there. It was Jesus. That's the kingdom. Remember when you found that treasure? Remember the first time? Remember when you found it? And that's all you could think about? Like, I've got a treasure. I've got a treasure. I've got a treasure. That's what he's talking about here. And Jesus says in verse 5 to John, repent and do the things you did at first. All right, go back to that field in the figure of putting in my in my mind. Go back to that field and take your shovel with you. Uh, in fact, take your little hand shovel. Don't even take a big shovel. You're going to get on your hands and knees and just dig it square foot at a time and just dig around in that field. Because you bought the field. It's your field. You know there's a treasure in the field, but you're just having fun in the field because you love that field. You love Christ. Go back there and find that treasure and, and play with that treasure and hold on to that treasure and cherish that treasure. Nothing in the world matters more than that treasure you have. So you have to repent. You have to change your mind. That's what repent means. It means to change your mind. And the best way to describe it is what Jesus told in the parable of the prodigal son. You know, he went and spent all his money on prostitutes and all kind of stuff, and then he didn't have anything. He was eating, taking care of pigs, but he didn't even have any food. The pigs were eating better than him. And it says in verse uh, Matthew in Luke chapter 15, verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. He's coming to his senses. He's thinking about this. And he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, now he's changing his mind about his condition. He's changing his mind about how he's lived his life. Hey, my father's got hired workers that are doing better than I am. I'll go back to him and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Just give me a job. And then here's the repentance, verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. Now, it wasn't just that he thought about it. It wasn't just that he changed his mind and said, hey, I, my father's got it, my hired, the people that work for us have got it made better than me. I'm going to just go back and ask for a job. That's not repentance. That's changing your mind. But repentance is when he got up and went home. He got up and went home. Of course, you know the rest of the story. But here we are, here I am. Here's the church in Ephesus. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ who walks among the lampstands and holds the stars in his right hand, the Son of God, commending the church and then reprimanding the church with this heavy criticism about not having any love. 
So you change your mind, repent. Change your mind about your loveless condition and go back. Go back to the things you remember doing when you were a young believer or a new believer. Live that way. The way you did when you were just in love with Jesus and you were in love with his people. Change your mind and go back to doing that. Go back to living that way. Rekindle your love for Jesus and his people in your local church. Now, we don't have to, I don't have to explain to you, we all know nobody is easy to love. I'm just going to, I'm not picking on any of y'all. Me, I'm not easy to love. Some of y'all are easier than others, but some are not. Most of us are not easy to love. Love God's people. I'll be honest with you, that's what I was talking about. Like, back then, it didn't really matter. I didn't care what was wrong with people. I really didn't care. Nothing mattered as much as just going and worshiping with God's people and fellowshipping with other Christians. Why does it matter now? Because they got bad doctrine? Because they're not as moral as me? Because they are weird, strange. I got some stories. I've told the stories already a hundred times already. Just some stories of Christians that I met that you just makes you go, "What?" I used to not think that way. Go back to the way you were before that. Turn away from the things that dulled your desire for Christ. Turn from whatever it was that stole your joy just from knowing Him. Turn from the things that made you not like people anymore, that made you not like God's people. God's people, he saved sinners. He only saved sinners. Yeah, they're weird. They got worse problems than that. Go back to that place before then, before you, before you lost it. Go back to that place, to the things you did before. And if you love the Lord, then your service for him, your turn and doing your whatever it is you have to do, your busyness, you're getting something done for the sake of the church or the sake of Christ or the sake of a brother is not a bother to you. If you love the Lord and if you love God's people, it's not a burden for you to serve. It's not a burden for you to do your time. It's not a burden for you to work. It's not. If you... uh love the Lord, then you remember. Just try this. Remember fresh. In a really fresh way, your heart, in your heart, that Jesus died for all your sins. Your sins are gone because Christ hung on the cross and died there for you. Just dwell on that. Think on the gospel. Meditate on the gospel. It will work in you. Something in you. If you think about that, and that's just what you meditate on, it will work in you so that you will give your life to serve other people. It'll, it'll work in you that you'll give your life to serve the Lord and nothing else will matter. And it won't matter. Everything else is secondary to loving him. Everything you want to serve others the way Jesus served us. That's remembering your first love. Remembering where you fell and going back and repenting and doing those things you used to do. You want to love other people the way God loved you. This is really important. This is not um, an optional step. This is not secondary. This is not... This is not minimal. This is serious. When Jesus says repent and do the things you did before, it's not optional. It's not suggestion. This is serious. He says, if you do not repent, verse 5, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. There's another interpretive issue. Some interpreters some of the good ones have said this is talking about Jesus' second coming, the parousia, his, his, his return. When he comes again, he's going to take the church out. 
of its place and get rid of it. I'm not sure that's what I believe he's talking about there, but I do believe it means he's going to, since he walks among the churches, since the church is his church and he inhabits the church, it's his church, he's going, he takes it very seriously about the character and the influence of his church in the world. It's more important to him that his church is the right kind of church than there even is a church. Now, it's his church. It's his people. He died to save them. He died for the church. He is the shepherd of his people, the shepherd of the sheep. That's his church. But he cares more that that church is the right kind of church than he cares that it even exists. Because if it exists and it's not the right kind of church, he's going to come take it away. A church that is not a loving church does not even need to be there. A church that's not a loving church, a church that has left its first love, love for Christ and love for his people, doesn't even need to be there. Not according to Jesus, I'll come and take it away. That's what the lampstand is. That means the church. So either go back to your first love or Jesus will take your church away. I know this sort of freaks us out because our doctrine is, you know, we, you can't lose your salvation. Our doctrine is that God is going to keep us forever. We know that's part of our, that's our doctrine. But here he says, I'll remove your church. And I don't want to minimize that. I don't want to downgrade that. That's serious. An unloving church is a bad testimony to the world. An unloving church does not have an effective ministry to the world. An unloving church is not a good gospel witness to the world. It is not what Jesus wants his people to be known for. He doesn't want his people to be known for good. I mean, good works is what he created us to do. But, hey, that church is doing good works. They just don't love anybody. Oh, that church is a moral church. Those are some moral people. They just don't love anybody. Oh, that church has the best doctrine. They have perfect doctrine. They just don't love anybody. I don't want to go to that church. Jesus doesn't even want that church to be around. He'll remove it. He will remove it if it's not a loving church. It matters more to Jesus that his church be a loving church than we even realize. Because we got these other important things that we put in front of that. We have these other important things that minimize our love for God, our love for Christ, our love for other people. Even though those are all good things, great things, Jesus wants a church that loves. Jesus wants a church that loves people. That loves his people more than anything. Loves him more than anything. And then he says in verse 7, we talked about verse 6 last time, you hate the Nicolaitans, the moral church. But here he says in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in paradise of God. There's another uh, testimony, another uh, grace that God gives us because he's gracious challenges the church and he does this for all the churches in the in the revelation it's a phrase that jesus used in his ministry a lot in one one place is matthew 9 13 9 he who has an, he who has ears let him hear which basically what he means by that is that he's given spiritual truth he's talking in parables no one knows what he's talking about even his disciples came up and said what are you talking about why do you speak in parables? No one has any idea what you're talking about. In other words, we don't know what you're talking about. But if you have ears to hear because the Spirit gives you understanding, then you can understand what Jesus is saying. Spiritual truth has to be spiritually discerned. Spiritual truth has to be spiritually applied by the Holy Spirit. And yet at the same time, while that's the Spirit's job, the Spirit's work in us to give us ears to hear, by Jesus saying that to you, He's put the responsibility on you. You are responsible. We are responsible to listen. 
We are responsible to hear what Jesus says and take heed, not to go home and go, oh, well, that was a nice lesson. We're supposed to take heed, repent, and go back and do the things you used to do. Remember the height from which you, fought, which you have fallen. Go back and love people the way you love people. Go back and love God the way you loved God before. Take heed to what the Spirit says. This is what the Spirit says. If he's moving in our lives, if he's working in us, then our church will hear what Jesus said. We'll hear Jesus' warning. We'll hear Jesus say to us, repent, and we'll be motivated to change. We'll hear Jesus' words to say, remember the height from which you fall, and we'll go back and remember. I did this yesterday. I did it today, too. Uh, there was a back when I was a young Christian this is an old lady now it was a rock singer named Margaret Becker she was a Christian artist she was really good and the songs were great and I used to sit and weep I went and found Margaret Becker and listened to those songs yesterday I was like, that's some good stuff just remembering God is gracious to us Take heed, put it into play, put it into practice, motivate, be motivated to change. And by doing that, we'll overcome. To him who overcomes, to him who by faith and perseverance overcomes, he'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is saying God's going to make sure that your salvation is secure. God's going to make sure that it already is secure in his plan and his purpose. That's what our salva- the doctrine of salvation is. God secures us by his spirit. It, but by faith, we overcome. By faith, we trust him. By faith, we have eternal life. By faith, we eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God where the thief on the cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. I'm not sure I know what all that means, but it's good. To him who overcomes, you get that. All right, that's all I have for if, to the church at Ephesus. Next uh, Wednesday, I won't be here. Uh, I'll make sure you have an excellent teacher. But, uh, I'm going out of town, but we'll pick up uh, the next church, Smyrna, two weeks. Let's pray. Father God, we are grateful for your word. I thank you that you've been kind to me tonight to let me teach it. I think you've been kind to all of us here tonight that we could hear it. And Lord, I know I thank you for your kindness to us to give us this opportunity to look back and remember how we uh, loved you more than we do now. To look back and remember how we loved each other more than we do now. And loved your people. And I pray, Father, you will help us to remember those things, to go back and do those things, to repent, to overcome, that you won't be displeased with us. You'll be, you will be pleased with us as well as all the other things that we will have good doctrine and we will have uh, morality and we will be a righteous and we will have plenty of good works. But let us be a church that loves. Let us be a people. Let me be a, a man who loves. Love you more than anything. Father, I pray that you'll bless the rest of our night and give us uh, safety as we go home. Give us a safe and blessed, productive, good rest of the week. Show us favor in everything. Bring us back together again Sunday that we can worship you in spirit and truth and just enjoy a fellowship of your people and worship. Do this so us, Jesus will change our lives even more, and he'll be glorified in us. 
ask it in his name. Amen.